Father God, we do praise you and thank you, and we come before you now in spirit and in truth to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we just, uh, Lord, we, we exult in you that you have given us your word to sing, to examine, to preach from, to teach from, to be edified with, to be uh, convicted with, to be encouraged with. Lord, this is an incredible gift that you have given to us by your grace, and so we thank you for it. And as we now look at it uh, in more depth, and in particular uh, the text from Revelation, we ask that you would now apply it to our hearts, and that you would instruct us by it, so that we would uh, be ever increasingly equipped as individuals, as families, and as a church, to then go forth and to be doers of it, and hearers of it, both, so that we would uh, go forth and advance your kingdom in this region. Lord, you alone have the power to grant such a gift, and so we come to you with great confidence for it, because we come in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 7 today. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them up to Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 7 is going to be our text. And uh, while some of you open to that passage, I'll simply note that originally, when I first set out to study this text, um, I was going to actually try to cover the entirety of chapter 10, uh, all the way through verse 11, but as I was preparing and as I was planning, I discerned that it was just getting a little bit uh, too long as far as notes-wise, and so I thought it'd be best to split it into two different messages. So we'll look at verses 1 through 7 today, and then, Lord willing, we'll look at verses 8 through 11 to finish chapter 10 next week. Uh, but with that said, as we open in chapter 10, uh, like usual, allow me to just begin by reminding us what we have been looking at up to this point, just a little briefly. So, uh, ultimately, since we've been working through Revelation since last summer, uh, we have been arguing that the book itself, uh, while it is, you know, kind of a contemporary understanding, one of the most more difficult books to understand in all of Scripture, uh, we have been arguing that the book itself is doing what the title suggests that it is doing, and that is, it is revealing something to us. It is a revelation. And the thing that it is revealing, as we've argued, is the uh, judgment that came against Israel for their apostasy in the first century. Right? In the first century, uh, first century Judaism had committed apostasy, they broke the covenant with the Lord, they rejected Jesus as the Messiah, largely, not every single one of them obviously, but largely as a nation they had rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and therefore judgment was to come upon them. And this was something that Jesus himself had even warned about during his earthly ministry in what is known as the Olivet Discourse, uh, found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And in particular, in Luke 21, Jesus actually warned that Israel would be surrounded by armies and destroyed. And he told them that all of that would happen in that generation. He said, all of these things will not come to pass until this, or all of these things will happen in this generation, and they won't all come to pass. Uh, how do they, I'm working, I'm messing up the way it's worded. But all of these things will happen in that generation, he said. And uh, lo and behold, he said that in about AD 30, Exactly 40 years later, which was considered one generation, in AD 70, Rome came in, uh, made war with Israel. They, they were in a war for about three years, from AD 67 to AD 70, culminated in AD 70 when Rome surrounded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed, uh, killed over a million of the Jews at that time. And that event, which occurred in the first century, is what we have been arguing the book of Revelation is symbolically and prophetically described. So, that's what we've been arguing for, and so when we get to chapter 10 now, we are in the particular section within Revelation, as we've also been noting the last couple of weeks, where we are unpacking uh, what is known as the trumpet judgments, where an angel will blast a trumpet, and then some form of judgment occurs. There are seven total trumpets to be blown, and we have seen six of them get blown up to this point. And so in the first one, we saw that upon getting blasted, the land gets burned up. And we argued that this was symbolic for how Rome would come in and burn the land, which they did. In the second blast, we saw that a mountain was tossed into the sea, and it became blood, and the ships were destroyed which we argued was symbolic for how uh, the Jewish ships at the time would be destroyed, and that's what happened in the first century when a, when they called the Black North Wind came and destroyed all of the Jewish ships. 
in the third trumpet blast, we saw that the rivers and the springs of Israel become bitter. And we argued that that was symbolic for how Rome would come and pollute the rivers with dead bodies, which they did, making them bitter. Fourthly, we saw uh, that the sun, moon, and stars, upon the fourth blast of the trumpet, go dark. And we argued that the sun, moon, and stars going dark is biblical language for judgment coming, and in particular, for leaders and kings to be killed or deposed in some way, that the leaders go dark. And so, in other words, when the sun, moon, and stars go dark, this is the Bible's way of often saying that there will be much political upheaval, which there was during this time. When Nero committed suicide, uh, he was replaced by multiple different men who either committed suicide shortly after or were killed while in the position of emperor, and there was a whole flurry of emperors who tried to become emperor at the time. So there was a whole bunch of political upheaval. In the fifth trumpet blast, we saw that the bottomless pit was opened, and out of it, right, out of the abyss, which was the prison of demons, uh, came a whole horde and swarm of demons to afflict the people in Jerusalem, it said, for five months, which just so happens to be the exact time period that the siege of Jerusalem lasted in AD 70. So we argued that the, the, the fifth trumpet referred to the conditions of what Jerusalem was going to be like inside the city during the siege, namely they were going to be oppressed by many demons. And then in the sixth trumpet blast, which we looked at just last week, we saw how John sees uh, a whole host of mounted troops, twice 10,000 times 10,000, come down from the north, from the Euphrates River, and attack Israel with fire and sulfur. And we argued that that was symbolic for the legions of Rome coming down to make war against Israel. So again, that's what we've looked at up to this point. Again, we've argued that all of these things are symbolic references for what was occurring in the first century in the judgment against Jerusalem. And that leads then right into our passage for today in Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. And so if you'd please rise as we read the Word of God together. Chapter 10, starting in verse 1, going through verse 7. This is the Word of the Lord. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Thus says the reading of God's word, may he write it on our hearts by faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at now for this morning. And as we were just mentioning prior to reading it, uh, we see here, uh, you know, in the context of the seven trumpets getting blown, we've already seen six of them get blown in the judgments that have occurred as a result. And having seen six of them so far, we might have expected to see the seventh one get blasted today, but we actually don't see that happen in today's text. Uh, and that's going to actually come later on in chapter 11, actually. The seventh one will occur. And so, therefore, we see a bit of a pause between the six and the seventh trumpet, where a couple of other things uh, are announced to us beforehand. And therefore, it's actually quite similar to the pattern we saw back in chapters 5 through 6, where, if you remember, in the seal judgments, uh, the scroll that the Lord Jesus took from the Father's right hand had seven seals on it, and he opened one of them at a, each one at a time. And we saw at that moment that, you know, between the, you know, after opening the sixth seal, and the seventh seal, that there was a pause or an interlude between that where a couple of things occurred. So now the very same pattern is occurring here, where we get to the sixth trumpet, but before we then get to the seventh and final one, the Lord takes time to announce a couple of other things before he gets there. So that's what he does here. 
And the thing that he is particularly announcing, as we see in these first seven verses at least, really, in a nutshell, is how the Lord simply takes time to encourage or announce his lordship over everything that is happening. That he takes time to declare his sovereignty and his control of the situation, and that all of this is happening by him as the sovereign king of it. Right? That's basically what he takes time to announce what we just read. And I think this is encouraging for us to remember, not only for us today, but then also for the readers who would have been reading this originally, in the midst of hearing all of this calamitous uh, destruction and chaos occurring that is going to soon now happen in Jerusalem, to hear all of this judgment after judgment, some of it very severe, to then have the Lord pause and just remind them that he's still in control, that he is the sovereign one, would have been a very reassuring word for them. And again, that's a very reassuring word for us even today as it pertains to our own personal circumstances or national circumstances or worldwide circumstances, whatever it is, to be reminded and encouraged here and there, uh, actually constantly really, that the Lord is in control, that none of this is happening by happen chance is a good thing for us to remind ourselves of. And so that's what we see in this text, and so from that, allow us to now just work through the text like usual, verse by verse, to see how this is the case, and then after that we will make a couple of applications to our life today. So, if you'll turn your attention back to verse 1 of chapter 10, it began by saying, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was shining like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. Alright, so, uh, having seen the six trumpet judgments occur, as we've already been saying, before the seventh one occurs, now in the interlude, in the pause, it says that John looks up and he sees a mighty angel coming down from heaven to the earth, and this mighty angel's description is given to us, particularly in a fourfold way here in verse 1. We're told that he was wrapped in a cloud, he had a rainbow over his head, his face was shining like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. Okay? So that is the description given to us, and as I've said many, many times before, and I will say again, when we hear descriptions like this in the book of Revelation, we are not primarily to take this as literal, as though mighty angels literally looked like this, but rather these are symbolic descriptions given to us uh, to highlight real things, real realities. And to help us then understand what these, this symbolic description indicates to us, what we need to do is we need to interpret it with Scripture. So allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture, which means we need to then go elsewhere in Scripture to see if this language or if this wording or if these symbols appear anywhere else. And if so, it will then help shed light on what is communicated here in Revelation. And so, when we take this fourfold description in turn, uh, the description of being wrapped in a cloud is language that is often used elsewhere in Scripture, particularly during the time of wil the wilderness wandering in, in the Old Testament. We see this uh, language often be used of God's presence Himself. If you remember in Exodus 40, verse 34 through 38, we are told that the cloud, it says, would fill the, uh, it actually filled the finished tabernacle, right? The cloud came in and covered it, or and it shrouded it and, and filled it. And we're also told in the same passage from Exodus 40 that uh, whenever the cloud would be lifted up, right, they would come up, that was the Israelites' sign that it was time to then pack up and move on. And then they would follow the cloud wherever it went, and then it would descend, it would stand over the place where it was, and it would then descend back down. And then that's where they knew to then make camp again. And this is how the Lord led them throughout their wilderness wanderings. And uh, we are even told in Leviticus 16.2 that uh, Moses and Aaron were told by the Lord that he is in the cloud over the mercy seat on the ark. And so, all that to say, the Lord being in the cloud, again, it's just that. It's, it's, an, it's an indication of God's presence with his people. We see this phrase of him being in the clouds actually many other times in Scripture as well, often in reference to him coming in judgment. We see that in Isaiah 19. We actually saw it at the very beginning of Revelation, chapter 1, where it says that Christ came in the clouds, uh, with the clouds. And so this language of coming with the clouds is often describing God's presence coming to his people. The second description of it uh, being like a rainbow over his head uh, might sound familiar because we read that just a couple of chapters ago, though that proved to be a couple of months ago, 
Um, if, but from Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, uh, when John was first caught up into heaven and he saw the throne room of the Lord, we were told that at that time a rainbow uh, was around the throne. And in Ezekiel's vision, when Ezekiel also saw the throne room of God in Ezekiel 1, 27-28, uh, he also describes seeing a rainbow over the Lord on his throne. And so to have this description of a rainbow over somebody is almost always used exclusively of the Lord on his throne. Thirdly, the face of a sun uh, is, again, language or description that we've already seen in the book of Revelation. Back in chapter 1, verse 16, this was the description given to Christ. Uh, when John first saw Christ, it says that his face was shining like the sun. And it's the same description given to Christ during the uh, Mount of Transfiguration experience in Matthew 17, 2. If you remember, when Jesus went up onto the mountain with Peter, James, and John, the same John who's now being given this revelation, uh, at that time it says that the Lord, you know, kind of revealed back his, his true glory, and his clothes became dazzlingly white, whiter than anybody could possibly bleach them, it says, and his face shone like the sun. And so this language of face shining like the sun is frequently used of Jesus himself. And then lastly, the reference to legs like pillars of fire, we see, uh, again, is language often referring to the Lord's presence back in the wilderness wandering times, like in Exodus 13, verses 21 through 22, where we're told that a pillar of cloud led the Israelites by day, as we've already noted, and a pillar of fire led them at night. And what's interesting is that uh, commentators will often point out that this dual image of a pillar, by, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night uh, almost serve as symbols for God's legs. Uh, not literally that God's legs look like this, but it's, it's a, like almost a picture of God's legs leading the people where they're supposed to go, which is also why, again, the language will often say that the cloud or the pillar would stand over the place where they were supposed to be. It's basically his legs, as it were, and that's actually how it's being described here. The legs are like pillars of fire. And so you put all that together, and this imagery of being wrapped in a cloud, having a rainbow above you, face shining like the sun, and having legs like pillars of fire, are all images and symbols to describe God's presence with his people. And therefore, my argument is that this mighty angel who comes down from heaven to earth at this point is none other than the angel of the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. This is, this is Christ now coming down to personally reveal something to John at this point in the Revelation, which then brings us to verse 2 and 3. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. Okay, so Jesus descends at this point, and first off, we note that he has like a little scroll open in his hand, and we're actually not going to cover that all in depth right now, because that'll actually be more, that, that scroll is going to come into play again once we get to verse 8 through 11. So we'll cover that more in depth next week. But here, we also see not only does he have this scroll, but it also tells us that he puts one foot on the sea, and he puts one foot on the land. And again, we are to be thinking this symbolically, not literally. And so, symbolically speaking, when we put this image together, we know that when the Bible often speaks of the sea and the land in the same context or in the same sentence, this is often the Bible's way of simply denoting all of creation. Oftentimes, you know, heaven will be thrown in there, or under the earth will also be thrown into this description, like heaven and earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all the deeps. Is usually the Bible's way of saying everything, absolutely everything. Therefore, for him to then put his foot on the land and on the sea is to say that God, Christ, is now standing over creation. But, not only that, uh, not only does sea and land often, you know, used to describe all of creation in general... But, throughout the Old Testament, we also see that the sea itself is often used as a metaphor, particularly for the Gentile nations, and the land is often used as a metaphor for the land of Israel. And so, for this then, for him to be having his foot on the land and on the sea, not only says that he's standing over creation, but he's standing over the Gentile nations and over Israel as well. And, for him to be standing over it, literally putting his foot on both, 
Again, to stand over something in Scripture, to have it under your feet, is to indicate that you have conquered it. You have beaten it. It's now your footstool. Uh, you are sovereign over it. it is, you're, you're, you're authoritative over it. So again, you put all that together, this is indicating that Christ now comes uh, absolutely authoritative, having conquered the world. He has conquered the Gentile nations. He has conquered Israel. He is the sovereign over all of it. Uh, as it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, which is quoting from Psalm 8, we are told that everything, including the creatures of the land and the sea, it says, are now in subjection under Christ's feet. So, that's what we see here now in Revelation 10. He comes, he puts his feet symbolically over both, saying he is sovereign over everything. And, not only that, but as he does this, we then go on to see in verse 3, that he then calls out with a loud voice, which actually first says it's like a roaring lion. Which again, Christ was described as the lion of the tribe of Judah just a couple chapters back. But the voice itself also sounds like seven thunders sounding. And that language of seven thunders sounding would have undoubtedly recalled the original reader's mind to a particular passage in, in general. And that particular passage is Psalm 29, actually, which I'm going to read in its entirety because it's a short psalm, 11 verses. But listen to this. It says this. This is a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory. The Lord is enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Right? That's Psalm 29, and as you'll perhaps have just noticed, this is a psalm that is particularly highlighting the kingship of the Lord God, and it particularly highlights the voice of the Lord. Right? He is king, he sits enthroned over everything, and he declares things with his voice, and it happens. And fascinatingly, his voice in Psalm 29 is explicitly likened to thunder, and the phrase, the voice of the Lord, which sounds like thunder, occurs seven times in that psalm. So he sounds out seven times with his thunderous voice in Psalm 29, and now we see in Revelation 10 that the mighty angel with a loud voice, like the seven thunders, uh, calls out, again, this is undoubtedly a connection between these two psalms, which is then all the more confirmation that this mighty angel is the Lord Jesus. He is described as the one authoritative over all of creation, and he, described, he calls out with the same mighty voice as that of God from Psalm 29. Which then brings us to verse 4. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Alright, so, fascinatingly, John, right, like he's been doing thus far throughout the entirety of the book, begins to write what he is seeing, what he's hearing. That's actually what he was told to do back in chapter 1, verse 11. Write these things down. So that's exactly what he goes to do. But as he sets out to do so, he then hears a voice explicitly commanding him not to write it down and to seal it up. Don't, don't write that part down. Right? Which then, you know, for us, as 21st century Americans, you know, now hearing that makes us all the more curious as to what Christ told him at this point. But to even speculate as to what Christ told him at this point is an exercise in futility, because if Christ wanted it to be kept secret, there's no way we're going to be able to find it out. Um, but what is also fascinating is that the Lord obviously inspired this text to be written in chapter 10, verse 4. So he inspired this to be written about something that was not allowed to be written, which tells us that God wants us to know that there are some things that he keeps secret. Right? He is not obligated to tell us everything. There are some secret things in the universe that it's just we don't know. And uh, this is something that Deuteronomy 29, 29 even tells us. We're told that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. 
But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So, again, it highlights there are secret things. The way God has constructed the universe to operate and to function, and there are spiritual realities that, again, frankly, we just cannot fathom with our finite human brains. We, we don't know it, and we never will, at least this side of glory. I don't know how much the Lord will reveal to us in heaven. I think it will be a lot more clear, but in any case, there are going to be secret things that we simply don't fully grasp now. However, as this, no, uh, this, this passage also notes, which I'll just comment on briefly because that's encouraging, he has revealed, though, much. He has revealed to us his law, namely the word of God. And therefore, everything we have in Scripture, we can take to the bank, and we can know from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, that it is absolutely sufficient for to equip us in every good work. Uh, everything that we need as it pertains to life and godliness is in Scripture. Uh, every right belief about God, every right action that we could do, every good thing we could do. Everything is absolutely sufficient. So we never have to think, well, because he does have secret things, he's keeping something that's vital for our salvation away from me, or vital to my sanctification away from me. He, he's not revealing that. That's not the case. Everything we need to know what the Lord, what we're supposed to believe and what we're supposed to do is in the revealed will of God, the Bible, which is therefore why Christians should be a people of the Word. We should be in the Word, reading the Word, studying the Word, memorizing the Word, and obeying the Word. It is His revealed will. But, in any case, He does have some secret things in the universe, and uh, what we see here in Revelation 10, 4 is one of those things. He tells them, seal that up, don't write it down. And when he's told, John is told to seal it up, that language itself is very reminiscent of what we see uh, the pro uh, happen in the life of the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, received a vision, and this is what it said. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. Okay, so Daniel received a vision. And he says, it's absolutely true, it's going to happen, but the Lord actually tells him likewise, seal it up, it's not going to happen for a good long time, many hundreds of years off, right? Then, you remember that, and you actually take what is told to John at the end of Revelation, which we haven't obviously gotten to yet, but in Revelation 22.10, interestingly, John is actually ultimately told the exact opposite. He is told, do not seal up the words of this prophecy of the book, for the time is near, okay? So, Daniel's told, seal it up, it's not going to happen for a long, long time. John, at the end of the book, ultimately is told, don't seal it up, it's very, very near. Which, once again, I would argue, confirms that the contents of Revelation are not describing events that are to occur hundreds or even thousands of years off into the future. Otherwise, you would have been told, like Daniel, seal it up, it's for many days from now. But he's not. He's told... Don't seal it up. These things are going to happen very soon. And indeed, as we go on to see, only a couple of years away in the destruction of Jerusalem. And so, all that to say, the majority of Revelation has occurred in the first century. But I say the majority and not the entirety because of passages like Dan, uh, Revelation 10.4, where John is told to seal up some of the things, which indicates that whatever Christ told John at this very moment was not going to be fulfilled within the scope of the first century, but was probably for many years off yet. But of course, we have no idea what Christ told him, so we have no idea what to expect to potentially come in. Is, has it already occurred? Is it yet to occur still? We don't know, because we don't know what Christ told him at this time. But all that to simply say, you put all this together so far, John sees Christ come down. He puts his right foot on the sea and his, or his yeah, his right. He puts one of the foot on the sea, one of the feet on the land, declaring his sovereignty over all of it. He declares something to John, which we don't know. He keeps it secret. And then, lastly, in verses five through seven of our text, and the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. All right, so here in the remainder of the passage, we see once again we're reminded that 
Christ is standing on the sea and on the land. We're told it again, indicating that this is an important detail. And as he does so, after telling John something that we don't know about, he then raises his right hand to heaven and swears an oath, which is what witnesses did in the Old Testament. And so this is now depicting Christ standing, basically, as a witness of these events that are transpiring in the book. And he swears an oath in the name of the Lord, by him who lives forever and ever, and then, in the oath, he actually appeals to the creational realities of the Lord. He, he swears by the one who created heaven and earth and the sea. And I would argue that he uses this creational aspect in this oath because, as a witness now to the new covenant, which is being enacted, uh, this was also, as we've said in the past, the inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth. And so with the inauguration of the new heaven to the new earth, he now swears by the name of the Lord with this creational language from the Lord. And what does John swear? He swears in the name of the Lord. What does he swear to do? Two things, ultimately. He says that when the seventh trumpet is sounded, which is going to yet happen, but when it does, he says two things. Number one, there would be no more delay. And number two, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. No more delay. Mystery of God would be fulfilled. And these are not even so much two things as they are kind of two sides of the same coin. They're kind of one leads to the other. They're both connected in this sense. So what do these two things mean? What does it mean to have no more delay in the mystery of God fulfilled? Well, to have no more delay, I would argue, refers to the judgment that was coming against Jerusalem at this time. If you remember from uh, chapter 6, in the fifth seal... John saw the souls of the saints under the altar, and they were crying out to the Lord in prayer, explicitly asking, How long, O Lord, before you will judge those who dwell on the land? How long before you bring the judgment, Lord? And at that time, the Lord answered, Rest a little longer. So he said, Just a little longer. Now it's back in chapter 6. Now here we get to chapter 10, and he's saying, there's going to be no more delay after the seventh trumpet, meaning the judgment is going to come decisively. We've already seen much of the judgment prophesied of what's going to happen, but he says at the seventh trumpet, it's going to be decisive and final, and it's all coming at that point. So there's going to be no more delay in that respect, and then that will, as we said, secondly, then ultimately indicate that the mystery of God has been fulfilled. So what does that refer to, the mystery of God being fulfilled? Well, when we hear the word mystery in our, in our minds today, we will often maybe think of things that are mysterious, or riddles and clues and puzzles and things of that nature. And ultimately, when it comes to the Bible's use of the word mystery, this is something actually Alex was pointing out when we were going through Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, it makes reference to the mystery of God's will. And as Alex pointed out, a mystery in Scripture is actually just a reference to something that had been formally concealed, but now it's been unveiled. Something that once was hidden, so it's kind of mysterious in that sense, but now it's fully disclosed. That's what the Bible refers to as mystery. And usually it refers to how there were things in the Old Testament where the Old Testament saints, frankly, did not see the whole picture of how things were exactly supposed to work. They, they, had, they had ideas and they had a little bit of the picture, but they didn't have the full picture. But then with the coming of Christ, and thus the coming of the new covenant and the inauguration of the new heavens and the new earth, all of these things were then revealed. And the thing that is particularly revealed that the scripture often emphasizes as being the mystery is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, which again Alex will get to eventually when we, as he keeps working through Ephesians. Um, but this is what it says. Listen to what Paul says. He says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So there's our language, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So there again, something was concealed in previous generations, but now it's revealed. That's what the mystery was. And then he explicitly tells us what it is in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Okay, so he actually explains what the mystery is in this context. He says, ultimately, that it was always God's plan and will to engraft the Gentiles into the body of Israel. This was always the plan of God from the very beginning, to make them fellow heirs, to make them partakers of the promises ultimately, of Abraham. 
right, as we see in the book of Galatians. And it would all happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was always the will to have Jew and Gentile alike become the one people of God. But, says Paul, this was in fact not fully made known to those in previous generations. Now we, in the New Covenant, looking back on the Old Covenant, can see types and shadows and hints and indications of it happening, of like, oh, this is kind of a foreshadowing of how the Lord would bring in the Gentiles. But he says, it wasn't absolutely explicitly made known. But, he says, now it has in fact been revealed to his holy apostles and his prophets. Which is exactly what chapter 10, verse 7 said. He announced this to his servants, the prophets. So this mystery has now been revealed. And again, that's the definition of the mystery. That believing Jews and Gentiles now comprise the one people of God, the church, through faith in Jesus. Which means the Lord is not going to only primarily work through ethnic Jews anymore, which he primarily did in the Old Covenant. And it means that the kingdom of God itself is not going to be restrained largely to the physical borders of the land of Israel. But rather it's not going to extend to all peoples, even Gentiles, which is to say non-Jewish people. And therefore the kingdom of God is going to encompass the entirety of the world. This is the mystery of God, right? That the world is going to be conquered by the gospel as Jew and Gentile alike come to faith in Jesus Christ. This was the will of God all along. It was hidden in days past, but now it's revealed in Christ. Therefore, you put all of that together, and we go back to Revelation 10, kind of by way of summation, it then makes all the more sense when we see how Christ stands on the land and on the sea, indicating his sovereignty over all the earth, particularly Jews and Gentiles. He stands over both, uh, ultimately uh, as a witness of the new covenant, and swears an oath that the old creation, ultimately represented by apostate Israel, was going to be destroyed. No more delay. And that the new creation, represented by the ingrafting of the Gentiles, the mystery, would begin. So that's what we see ultimately being highlighted in this text. Or in other words, as we stated at the start, with the destruction and the calamity of Jerusalem... Right? Again, no more delay for that. With that happening, Christ is now declaring his lordship over all of creation, and that the world will increasingly be conquered to him as Jews and Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we see happen and emphasized in this passage. And as I said, we're going to see how John then reacts to that, and what occurs in verses 8 through 11 of the text, but we'll save that for next time. For now, having just walked through the text verse by verse and seen the Lord declare his sovereignty and that he is in control of all of this, we can turn our attention to application for the last few minutes. And the question is, how do we apply a passage like this then to our lives today as 21st century American Christians? <clears throat> and the answer, uh, to kind of build up to it, is to simply remember everything we've been just looking at, namely in verse 7 in particular, that the mystery of God has been fulfilled. He said this, the mystery of God has been fulfilled, which is to say that the gospel of Christ, the good news that Jesus has come to the earth, he died on the cross as an atonement for sin, he rose again from the dead, triumphant over death and sin, he ascended into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of the Father, he rules and reigns with authority over all of heaven and earth, his feet is upon the sea and the land, which is to say he is now drawing all the world, Jew and Gentile, to himself and is thus advancing the kingdom. All of these things are present realities. That we're, that the mystery of God has been fulfilled. We are not waiting for these things to begin someday. We're not waiting for Christ to begin ruling and reigning someday when these things will start to happen. But for now we just have to kind of grind it out. Now these are current realities already. He is ruling, ruling now. He is reigning now. He is conquering now. But of course, it is a spiritual war, which is to then say that there are many giants and dragons and enemy fortresses in the land that are yet to be toppled. So that doesn't mean everything is just going to be peachy keen and smooth and no more troubles and no more suffering any longer now that Christ is ruling and reigning. No, it means we're engaged in a great spiritual war. There are going to be times where we have to go on the offensive and bring the attack to the enemy. There are going to be times where they attack us and we have to put up our defenses. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a fight, a spiritual fight in this, in this world. But the point is that we will, by the grace of God the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and for the glory of Jesus the Son, be victorious in the war. 
right? Not just at the very end of the war, like, well, yeah, he wins in the end, but right now we get clobbered. No, right? It, the reality is, over the course of time, there's going to be ups and downs, to be sure, but it's going to be a gradual, increasing victory in the world over sin. And so because of this, because of all of those glorious realities, which we see highlighted now in our text, here's the actual application. Ready? Right? It is to then lay yourself out to fulfill the Great Commission. Right, which is the, the fulfilling of everything we've just seen. Right? Lay yourself out to fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission being, as you all know, uh, Jesus declaring to the church prior to his ascension, after his resurrection, he was saying, go into all the world now, in light of everything he just did. Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that Christ commanded them. That was the thing he said, and he actually said, he prefaced it by saying, I have all authority in heaven and earth, therefore go. So the command is not actually go, it is therefore go, right? Because he has all the authority, go. And then he ends it by saying, and lo, I am with you always to the, to the end of the age. So he's got all the authority in heaven and earth, he's always with us, therefore he says, go, right? Go conquer the world. Right? That's, that's our commission, and so that is what I'm exhorting us to lay ourselves out to do. And our particular mission, then, in the overarching Great Commission is to then be at work doing just this right here in this region. This is the part of the nation where He has put us, and therefore we lay ourselves out to fulfill it here, to be gospel living in this place to see the kingdom advance. Because ultimately, the providence of God makes no mistakes, which means if you are here, then you are here by God's design. He has deployed you here to... To, to, to advance the kingdom here, right? If you wanted to do someplace else, you would be someplace else. If you wanted to have been born in a different time period, he, if you wanted that, you would have been born in a different time period. If you wanted to be in a different station in your life, he would have put that station in your life. But you are where you are, in the station you're in, at the time you're in, by a purpose, right? He's not just doing it happen, by happen chance. These things are designed by God. He's deployed you, and so it's a very great privilege and honor to know. This is not by chance or accident that I'm right where I am, doing what I do. This is because God himself is appointed that I be here, doing what I do, right, to advance his purposes right at this time. It's a glorious time to be alive. God does not make mistakes in that regard. So, therefore, lay yourself out to fulfill it here with what God has given you. Use your time, your money, your energy, your resources, your giftings, your vocation, your station in life again, whatever the Lord has entrusted to you and made you a steward of, invest that for the sake of advancing the kingdom right where God has put you. And so, young men, this means that you be steadfast in your strength and integrity. That's how God has made you, be steadfast in it. Young ladies, this means that you be steadfast in your modesty and purity. This is how God has made you. Fathers, you mean it means you be steadfast in your protection and provision of your family in faith. All of this is in faith. Mothers, be steadfast in the care and nurture of those under your charge, your children. Uh, husbands, be steadfast in leading and loving your wife. Wives, be steadfast in respecting and honoring your husband. Grandparents, be steadfast in aiding your children and your grandchildren to walk with the Lord, knowing that they are the ones who the baton is being handed off to. They are the ones who are going to be going into the next generation. And so invest in them. Uh, as citizens and employees, it means you be steadfast as salt and light in your neighborhood and workplace. And as a churchman, as a member of the church, as, a body, as the body of Christ, it means you are steadfast in the worship of the Lord like what we're doing right now on these Sunday mornings, the Lord's Day. It means you are steadfast in your evangelism of the lost, and you are steadfast in your fellowshipping with one another, the saints, even beyond just Sunday morning, right? So that you can grow in unity and camaraderie with one another. The Lord uses all of these things, as seemingly average and mundane as it seems on the surface. And there's nothing flashy necessarily about anything I just said. There's nothing like headline catching of like, wow, he's just being a husband and a father. He's just being a, a wife and a mother. Like, it, there's nothing like seemingly crazy about any of that. And yet these are the things that the Lord uses, faithfulness in these seemingly little things, to then live in a place over the course of generations. And so we have to have the long game in view, but this is what we're called to do. 
whatever we do, this is part of the last warning here, whatever we do, do not be the third servant in the parable of the talents who received much from the Lord and then just dug a hole and buried it. Didn't do anything. And as I often say, it's not like he took that and then went and squandered it and wasted it all. His sin was in the fact that he simply did nothing at all. He actually returned all of it back to the master. So he didn't, he didn't lose anything. He said, here, everything you gave me, I will give it all back. But the master actually called him a wicked and lazy servant. The Lord is not interested in us just simply giving us back what he gave to us. He wants it back with returns, right? We need to invest what he has given to us and then bring it back and say, you see, I've taken your one talent and I've turned it into two. Right? And he would have said, like he did for all the others, well done, good and faithful servant. And so don't be the third servant who receives much. I'm just going to sit on it. I'm just going to bury it. Instead, invest it unto the Lord. And here is then the final word. You can take heart as you do this. You can take actual confidence in doing this because we are in the new covenant. Right? The mystery of God has been fulfilled. The work of Christ in, in redemption has been accomplished. The nations are going to be converted to Christ. The world is going to be one. Like this is going to happen in time and history. And so we can lay ourselves out to the fulfilling of it and being faithful in our position. So that when the master does return, as we just said... We will hear that blessed commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in the little bit that I gave you, in the time that I put you in, with what I entrusted to you. You were faithful in that. I will make you faithful over much. Come to the joy of your master. May that commendation be given to every single one of us. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you and we thank you. We exalt in you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We praise you for the, the great victory that you accomplished at the cross, in the resurrection, in your ascension, in your current reign and rule at the right hand of the Father. Lord, we thank you that you are conquering the world to yourself, that your foot is upon the land, it is upon the sea. You are sovereign over everything. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this glorious reality. And I'm asking now, Lord, that you would help us to rejoice in these things in times of anxiety, that you would call it to mind so that we wouldn't fret uh, ultimately at the state of the world, that we wouldn't ignore it, but that we would then fight back in faith, knowing that you use uh, these glorious everyday means of faithfulness to you to then advance your purposes in any given place. So, Lord, help us to do that. Lord, make us faithful for an entire lifetime and help us to be faithful to pass it on to our children and our grandchildren and the next generation and to those around us. Lord, give us faithfulness in the small things so that over the course of our whole life, they will have accumulated to big things and uh, that you would then, that we could look in 50 years, AD 72, 2072 here, Lord, in, this, in the town of Akeley, that it would be distinctly more Christian then than it is now. Lord, we pray for that blessing even as we speak right now. Lord, you can see into 2072 as clearly uh, as, 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 as can be. And so, Lord, we're praying that you would use this prayer now as the means of accomplishing this great end. We pray all of this in the good name of Christ. Amen. The charge for this morning is this, that because of the triumph of Christ alone, His life, His death, His resurrection, His rule and reign, not only are our sins forgiven and vanquished, but now the world at large will steadily be one to Him, like leaven working through the dough, or like a mustard tree becoming the largest tree in the garden, Matthew 13. And so, because of this, let us labor to that end, right here where God has placed us, day in and day out, over the long haul, teaching our children and our grandchildren to do the same, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.